Hello, and welcome to Novel Biomedical's educational webinar series. Today we have the great pleasure to have Dr. John Toffaletti from Duke University Medical Center to present on the topic of pre-analytical errors in critical care testing. Dr. Toffaletti received his PhD degree from the University of North Carolina and did his residency in clinical chemistry at Hartford Hospital. He is currently the professor of pathology and also the laboratory director at Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Toffaletti has a great experience in critical care testing with over 60 publications in peer-reviewed journals. He is also the author of the textbook Blood Gases and Electrolytes. This webinar is approved for continuing education for PACE and ACCEP units and also CERP units for nurses. After the webinar, you will receive an email with directions of how to obtain these credits. Also, at the end of the webinar, there will be a live Q&A session. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Toffaletti to start the presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much, Evan, for that introduction. Uh, my talk today will focus on a highly important area of uh, critical care testing, which is the pre-analytical variables that commonly cause errors in these tests. The tests I will focus on are the electrolytes, including ionized calcium, blood gases, lactate, and also coximetry. Let me start by mentioning my disclosures. They're listed here. However, I want to importantly note, note that no products will be mentioned in this talk. Here are the learning objectives. So just to briefly go over these, after this presentation, you should be able to describe common causes of pre-analytical errors. I'll talk about many aspects of those. You should be able to list the common causes of hemolysis and how to report results on hemolysis specimens, and there are many of them there. And then be able to implement practices to minimize pre-analytical errors in these various measurements. That's the whole point of this talk, to improve any processes that may not be done as well as they possibly could be. And maybe I'll also learn some things as well from this talk. I've listed here the phases of testing. The ones at the three at the top are the pre-analytical phases, the one in the middle of sample analysis, of course, is the analytical phase, and then the last two in red are the post-analytical. And those are all things that we can affect or improve on, even things like test ordering or interpretation of test results by making uh, ordering and uh, our reporting very clear. So I'll talk about each of these, and I also note here, and with that asterisk, that the phases where point-of-care testing may have advantage over lab testing. Certainly for specimen handling and transport, point-of-care testing has a big advantage because normally you would expect that you collect a sample and can run it virtually right away. So there's almost no transport, little sample handling, and uh, you and get the results quickly. So that's also good. This slide here about the pre-analytical errors that account for a large number of errors in testing. I got this while I was attending a symposium back in Prague in 2012. But it highlights the difference between point-of-care testing and laboratory testing. And it shows that the majority of point-of-care testing errors are analytical, but a significant portion are also pre-analytical, about a third. Well, with laboratory testing, the analytical errors are fairly small, but a large percentage of those are pre-analytical. Let me emphasize that does not mean uh, that 88% that, that, uh, of lab tests have pre-analytical errors. It just means that 88% of a very small number uh, of overall errors are due to pre-analytical, but the majority of errors in lab testing uh, are pre-analytical. Just wanted to briefly mention that when comparing the, the personnel responsible for specimen rejection, when there is a rejected specimen, it's relatively uncommon to find that it's done by a phlebotomist or a lab-trained person. Uh, the rate is higher but still small. When, uh, when looking at other in-hospital personnel, such as nurses, uh, perfusionists, anesthesia techs, and, and doctors as well. It's still small, and I don't want to put them down at all because often they, uh, in fact, all the time, they have other responsibilities in the care of the patients. And uh, also they have more challenging blood collection as well, such as maybe from a catheter or an IV line. 
And to minimize this, you know, continual education is important to help uh, to minimize these collection errors. And it's also any time you have to deal with non-lab personnel, you have less influence or less uh, or less influence over them, and so that becomes a bit more difficult. For blood gas analyzers and point of care testing in general, we use a whole blood. We test whole blood. That has a lot of good uh, factors about it, a few that are not so good, some disadvantages. But it's especially advantageous for point of care testing. First of all, and very importantly, immediate analysis is possible. If you look down there, I probably should have put no centrifugation is needed right under that because that's what makes the analysis uh, right away that you can do right away immediately. There are minimal metabolic effects if you analyze a sample quickly. Icing is not necessary. For pediatric applications, you can analyze virtually all the sample is available, or you can analyze virtually all of the sample. Well, if you use serum or plasma, you really throw away about half of the sample. There are no dilutional effects, as we'll see with, uh, with some electrolytes measured on large chemistry analyzers. I've already said no certification is needed. That's a huge advantage. Some of the negatives are that heparin may affect test results. Well, heparin also can affect when we uh, analyze plasma. And a big part of that is how much we fill the tube. Obviously, if we fill the tube half full, we're going to double the heparin concentration or any anticoagulant or anti-glycolytic agent that happens to be in the tube or the syringe. With whole blood, hemolysis is not easily detected, and that is a very significant issue that we have to deal with, and we'll talk about that later. And cell metabolism may affect the test results if the testing is delayed. So it's the opposite end of the coin that uh, up above I said there are minimal metabolic effects, and that's true if you analyze a sample quickly. If there's any delay, you can, with whole blood, in any situation, you're going to get more metabolic effects. Okay, next to mention the types of preanalytical errors. Uh, the first is contamination with IV fluids. That happens uh, not too uncommonly. The wrong collection tube, again, not doesn't happen very often. Labeling errors or incorrect patient labels can occur. Uh, that's more frequently we find when uh, during like an operate during an operating room where maybe they've left some patient labels or pre-printed them, and somehow those get put on the wrong sample. If there's insufficient blood volume in the tube, that of course can mean there's not enough sample to do the testing can also increase the concentration of heparin, as I mentioned before. Hemolysis is a big one. It's a big one for some of the very important tests, especially potassium, some of the enzymes, um, and it's also sometimes hard to detect. Clots in blood can cause problems, both with testing itself and also affecting the analyzer. Any delay in transport, uh, particularly if it's over 30 minutes, can certainly cause uh, some type of metabolic effects. Might be more likely to have leakage if there's some kind of uh, shaking or over ex excess moving of the sample. And ultimately, if we don't do the sample quickly, it can cause loss of clinical usefulness. Let me start off with the tests themselves with the preanalytical errors and sodium measurements. First of all, hemolysis does not usually affect the sodium result to any great degree. The sodium concentration of red cells is about 10% that of blood. Uh, and if you do a like, math calculation, it might surprise you how little that affects, actually affects the, uh, the sodium concentration in the blood. However, if hemolysis is severe, it can cause a pseudo-hyponatremia. What we do run into is gross lipemia or very elevated protein levels that can cause a falsely low sodium if a diluted sample is analyzed. And that really is an analytical error. And this occurs with our large chemistry analyzers where they use ion-selective electrodes, but they dilute the sample prior to analysis. And if there's ever any an, an improper anticoagulant, like a sodium-containing anticoagulant, I've listed those there with sodium heparin or sodium citrate, obviously that's going to affect the sodium concentration. Now, this slide is a new error in sodium measurements. It's not that new anymore because it was the first to uh, detect over 10 years ago, but I've just been made more aware of over the last few years. So here's the situation. If we have a decreased plasma protein level, that can falsely increase the sodium levels in diluted ISC methods, not in the undiluted methods like we get on blood gas analyzers, but in the ones that dilute the sample prior to electrolyte analysis or sodium analysis uh, on the chemistry analyzers. So the problem with this is that true normal results for sodium, normonatremia, can become pseudo-hypernatremia, or true hyponatremia can become pseudo-normonatremia. 
And the problem with this is, the concern about this is that low protein levels are much more common than elevated lipid or protein levels in ICU patients. One study showed that in ICU patients, 73% had decreased total protein, 26% had normal total protein, and only 0.3% had elevated total protein. So elevated total protein is quite unusual among uh, ICU patients. And as protein levels decreased below 6 grams per deciliter, so if the levels were above 6, there was very little effect. But as you got below 6% of samples with direct versus indirect ISD sodium differences that were 4 or more millimole per liter, they began to increase. So at about 16% right at 6, per, 6 gram per deciliter, as you got lower and lower, could uh, increase over 80% of errors of a 4 millimole per liter or more. Moving on to potassium, there are many factors that can increase potassium during or after blood collection. And these are commonly cellular release after blood collection. There's hemolysis of red cells very commonly. That can be detected in chemistry analyzers, but it's difficult in blood gas analyzers. Platelets can also release potassium. They do that normally with any kind of, with, during clotting. Any other type of platelet activation that occurs after, uh, after collection can also help uh, increase the amount of potassium released from platelets. White cells usually not a problem because they are centrifuged down with the red cells. However, when you have high white cell counts, there's a situation that can cause uh, excess cell life of the, of the white cells, and that can increase potassium as well. Any type of excessive delay in cell separation can increase the amount of leakage. Usually if it's less than about three hours with most samples, it's not a big issue. But if a sample has a very high platelet or white cell count, even a one hour, even less than one hour can affect the results. And over too long icing or refrigeration of whole blood can increase the potassium by cell leakage out of the, out of the cell, the red cells. If the improper order of draw occurs, uh, that, that can also be a problem. So you should always collect blood for potassium analysis before collecting blood in any type of lavender or gray top twos because they contain either potassium EDTA or potassium oxalate. The other concerns or other problems that can occur is when there's vigorous shaking of the tube, excessive centrifugation, pneumatic tube transport, uh, gel barriers, if, uh, particularly if they're respun and there are other causes like that. The effect of increased cell counts on potassium results is shown here. Platelets, as I mentioned, the normal clotting process can increase potassium slightly by anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3 millimoles per liter. High platelet counts, like thrombus, as in with thrombocytosis, even though it's not very frequent, can increase potassium even more. Leukocytes are white cells. Normally not a problem again, but when you get very high white cell counts, like in the 100,000 per microliter range, that can markedly increase potassium. And I'll give an example of that later. Furthermore, this can have variable effects in serum, plasma, or whole blood. It also has variable effects among analyzers, blood gas versus chemistry analyzers. Then we have probably the most common is that's red cell hemolysis. I mentioned both in vivo and in vitro hemolysis because just to emphasize if it's in vitro, that's much less common, but that also means that's the correct result. That is what the patient is experiencing. More commonly, if there's hemolysis, is due to in vitro, and we can usually tell that by the color of the sample being bright red if it's in vitro hemolysis. And I've listed there some of the uh, approximate effects on uh, potassium of various levels of hemolysis. So slight hemolysis, maybe only 0.1 millimole per liter of potassium is increased, and that's not too much of a concern. With moderate hemolysis, maybe in the 0.2 to 0.3 millimole per liter range. With gross hemolysis, it can be one millimole per liter or more. And of course, these are not, these are, these are, there's a gradual, there's a gradation of effects on potassium as you go with more and more hemolysis. As we hopefully know, we should not use this to correct the potassium result. This is a hemolysis, and there are many. The first is prolonged tourniquet application over too much fist clenching, that can uh, lead to hemolysis. Usually not huge effects on the, uh, on the sample, though. Cell rupture during collection. If we apply excessive suction to the syringe, pulling too hard, that can affect cause hemolysis. Using too small bore needle, 
When you get to 23 gauge needles or smaller, that's especially prone to causing hemolysis. Any type of forceful squirting of the blood from the syringe in the tube will, uh, can encourage hemolysis. So anytime you do the squirt blood from a, through a needle into a, an evacuated tube, that's going to be a forceful expulsion. And even when it's an open tube, if you, it's very easy in the time to, to save time that, uh, that, uh, the, 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 there's forceful squirting of the blood and it goes very quickly through the syringe to the needle and it can cause hemolysis. Any type of difficult collection can cause hemolysis. Excessive squeezing to obtain blood, especially so with finger or heel stick collections, uh, which can occur with point of care and pediatric patients. During transport, delays, any type of excessive delays, extreme temperature variations, either too cold, too hot, rough handling, and also pneumatic transport. During processing, excessive centrifugation force or time can affect hemolysis, cause hemolysis. I want to emphasize again that in vivo hemolysis is a biologic process and is not a preanalytical error because that is occurring in the patient. And that can confuse things because that is the correct result and, uh, and should be reported. We also have to always be a little bit cautious that high bilirubin or high met hemoglobin levels can appear as hemolysis. I would say more frequently these can be a problem a problem or a concern when there's already some hemolysis and these make it look even worse. So those are all issues that, that we have to deal with and, and it makes the dealing with hemolysis a very challenging situation. How, how should we report results with hemolyzed samples? With chemistry analyzers, they do have the advantage now with modern chemistry analyzers that they often provide a hemolysis index. And this was absolutely essential because with automation now, the technologists often do not even see the sample once it's spun down. If this is done, the certification is automatic. Uh, but the, the good news for the chemistry analyzers is they have spectrophotometric means of doing a pretty good job of detecting hemolysis and giving a gradation scale. With whole blood analyzers, this is much more challenging because currently they cannot detect hemolysis in the sample by themselves. So a lot of questions we could deal with these in much greater detail. I'd be happy to have any discussion with this later. How should you handle possible hemolysis in blood gas specimens? And this is different with adult versus pediatric specimens. How should we handle reporting results on hemolyzed specimens? Well, do we, what should we do routinely versus when a physician insists? And I'll just say real quickly, with, uh, we could discuss this further later, that what we've decided after a lot of discussion, I mean months of discussion on this, is, is we routinely do not report potassium results on a, above a certain level of hemolysis. If the physician insists on it, we will ask for another sample, recollection. If that's hemolyzed, then eventually we will then give them the results with a lot of cautionary statements and comments on the report. What about laboratory versus point of care testing? Uh, I would say uh, fairly confidently that hemolysis is less likely detected with point of care testing, that the person uh, is not attuned to that and they'll take not necessarily any result they get, but they're more likely to take as a result without questioning it. There's also the issue of in vitro versus in vivo hemolysis. And just remember again, if it, if it is in vivo, that is the correct result. And also, what about a falsely high potassium versus a falsely normal potassium? Which is more likely to go undetected? Well, I think we'd all agree that a falsely normal potassium that is truly a hypokalemia will be much less likely to be detected. And when should we check for hemolysis? By centrifugation. on to ionized calcium. Let me just start by a little uh, primer on the bound versus free forms of calcium in, in blood. So we have the total calcium, which consists of protein-bound calcium, ionized calcium, and complex-bound calcium. The proportion of these are approximately, for protein-bound calcium, somewhere between 40 and 45 percent. Ionized calcium normally around 45, maybe 50 percent. And the complex-bound calcium is uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent. And just to briefly go over these, the, I look at the, well, most importantly, the ionized calcium is the physiologically active calcium. That is what the, our heart muscle, our cells of muscle, our nerve, that's what they sense, and also the parathyroid gland as well. And so that we call that the physiologically active calcium is probably what we should measure uh, as often as possible. There's also protein-bound calcium, which I think of as kind of a reservoir of calcium. Importantly, pH affects the equilibrium between calcium bound to protein and free, free ionized calcium. So at more acidic pHs, lower pHs, 
that's going to favor dissociation of the calcium ions from the protein, increasing the ionized calcium. A higher, more alkaline pH will cause more calcium being bound to the albumin. And over on the right, we look at the complex bound calcium. That is calcium bound to relatively low molecular weight anions. And if we look at these, that's bicarbonate, citrate, phosphate, and lactate. And the important point here to remember is that all of those uh, can change either slightly or dramatically with cr in critical care situations. Bicarbonate is affected by acid-base balance disturbances. Citrate can be given with citrated blood products. Phosphate can change with change in renal function. And lactate can increase rather dramatically with hypoxic conditions or with the uh, with the uh, mitochondrial dysfunction that occurs in sepsis. So just remember, with ionized calcium is all in equilibrium, and pH can affect that, and adding any type of calcium chelator can affect that equilibrium. So many factors can uh, can affect ionized calcium concentrations in blood. I've mentioned anticoagulants. So EDTA and citrate are bad. They're very tight binders of calcium. And heparin can have an effect depending on its concentration and the type of heparin used. Clotting, surprisingly, and I'll show you some data on this, clotting can cause unpredictable effects on ionized calcium with a mean decrease of about 0.03 millimoles per liter and quite a variation also, and I'll show that in just a minute. Storage can affect ionized calcium. So anticoagulated blood will have metabolism occurring, can produce acid, and can increase, increase ionized calcium. It can also produce lactate. But curiously, there's a odd equilibrium that occurs where lactate binds some of the calcium produced and tends to offset the effect of the hydrogen ions that are produced elsewhere in metabolism. <coughs> when cerebroplasma is exposed to air, or blood as well, exposed to air, that causes loss of carbon dioxide, the sample becomes more alkaline, and ionized calcium can decrease. And less likely, but can occur, is extreme hemolysis, gross hemolysis, can have a dilutional effect on the calcium results, as it would similar to sodium. This table here, which is a busy table, and this is what we have. We provide this for our technologists so that they can make a fairly independent decision when they get various types of samples and various types of specimen containers. We have on the left column, unopened syringe, syringe is open briefly, uh, unopened vacutainer, uh, more than half full, unopened vacutainer, less than half full, open vacutainer, more than half full, open vacutainer, less than half full, and finally at the bottom, heparinized capillary tubes. And what we have is uh, appropriate or acceptable time delays that we will accept the sample of result from each of those containers. And I won't go over those, but basically, uh, you know, just look at the top one, unopened syringe, we'll give a result with no comment up to 60 minutes, and even up to eight hours, but we will comment on that because the sample's been sitting around and, 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 and the result may be slightly compromised. And now hopefully you'll have this where you can look at it and use that if you feel like necessary in your actual lab setting. Looking at the anticoagulant effects on ionized calcium, as I've said before, citrate or EDTA must never be used. Older liquid heparins significantly decrease calcium. Now, that will dilute blood and bind calcium ions and also dilute anything that's not in the liquid heparin itself. So this was a little problem back years ago when blood gas analyzers, you did only pH, PCO2, and PO2. But now that they do electrolytes and lactate and glucose and maybe others, that becomes a big problem. However, the good news is, as you probably know, liquid heparin is almost never used anymore. But the areas where we found it being used is in the poorer countries and more, maybe poorer uh, locations uh, to save money, where they add the liquid heparin to the tubes or the syringes in order to be, uh, which is apparently less expensive than buying the pre-heparinized syringes and tubes. Ordinary dry heparin in syringes or tubes will decrease calcium. And for example, 25 IU per ml of sodium heparin will decrease ionized calcium by about 0.05 millimoles per liter. That would be the same with lithium heparin as well. However, many dry heparin preparations have been developed to minimize this effect. These could be most commonly calcium balanced heparin or electrolyte balanced heparin. And there's also one uh, made by a company that has the heparin dispersed in a fast dissolving saccharide web. I like to think of this as like cotton candy. So heparin is uh, bound to cotton candy, dissolves very quickly, and that the uh, allows them to use less heparin, but it gets it dissolved very quickly. A study we did now quite a number of years ago, published in 2001, where we looked at various uh, syringes and also blood collected for serum. 
on the uh, x-axis, we have the different syringes. On the y-axis, we have changes in ionized calcium. And the, the, the colorful areas to see the more solid blocks, those are the mean changes. So, for example, in the first one on the left, there's a mean change of either a half full or a full syringe of relatively small, you know, less than 0.01 millimole per liter decrease. The next one would be a slight increase. And so you can see that there, uh, with, with the first three products, there are very little change, although the variation uh, was, was less for that, that product that has a very low heparin. There's a product no longer made that used Zig heparin, and that's the fourth one of those. And you can see that it had a modest effect when full, but a bigger effect when it was half full, and also a lot of variability. Now, the surprising one of this is when we looked at serum. The average change in serum when you collect serum is about a decrease of about 0.03 millimoles per liter, but a lot of variation. Now, you may be asking, how do we know what the true value was? Well, back in the day, we would collect blood from volunteers, healthy volunteers, and inject it without any coagulant, and inject it immediately into our blood gas analyzer. And then the rest we'd put into various tubes or, syringe, or, or, or syringes. And we consider the value we got on the unheparinized, immediately analyzed samples. That was the true value. And so we looked at changes versus that. So that's how we did it. Uh, don't recommend that. But we, uh, we, you know, if we did it really right away, we did, I don't recall we ever got a clot. Now, lactate. Lactate has achieved much greater importance over the last several years because it's used with sepsis. Sepsis is very common. It's also been, always been a marker for hypoxemic conditions. Also want to emphasize that lactate increases when there's mitochondrial dysfunction because that just means the body is or the cells are unable to utilize oxygen properly. So let's look at how lactate increases in blood containing various types of uh, anticoagulants, anticoagulants or additives. Starting at the top, we have plasma, either cold uh, temperatures or room temperature. If we add fluoride oxalate to that, like in a gray top tube, even after eight hours, there's very little change in lactate, less than 0.03 millimoles per liter. I would say that we can easily go to 24 hours and have virtually uh, very insignificant effects if there's fluoride oxalate present in plasma. If you leave plasma at room temperature, no additives, good for about two hours with uh, maybe only a 0.1 millimole per liter change in lactate. Whole blood at room temperature with fluoride oxalate, also quite stable. After two hours, very little change in lactate. Whole blood on ice is pretty good, with additive either being no additive or heparin. After 60 minutes, only again, again, a very small increase in lactate. However, at the very bottom, when we get with whole blood, room temperature, and no additive, uh, after 30 minutes, we uh, do see a significant change in lactate of about 0.3 millimoles per liter. And that can vary. And let me show you a study we did just for our edification. We looked at five different samples in time the changes in lactate when they're stored at room temperature. These are heparinized blood gas samples at room temperature. And you can see that the average, that solid line, is exactly what we had reported earlier, or what others reported, of a 0.3 millimole per liter change in lactate after 30 minutes. So the average is exactly that, and it's fairly consistent, very linear as you go up in greater time. However, you do see that there's variations. So that one sample, I believe that would be sample number five, had a higher change than that, faster, more rapid change in lactate, while the others tend to be right on around the mean or maybe a little bit less. But I think it's good to, to go with the average and, and just be careful about all those other conditions. Coaxymetry, but some of the other, other analyzers are included here as well. So with coaxymetry, the collection is important. We can get venous admixture. You know, let's say we want to collect an arterial sample. It's possible to get some of the venous blood in that or vice versa if we want a venous sample. If we go deep enough, we might get an arterial sample. We hope not. But that can cause oxyhemoglobin and oxygen content errors. But either way, whether it be venous or arterial. If there's insufficient line waste draw, you can get contamination with that IV fluid. Extracellular fluid contamination is particularly uh, common with capillary samples. Among the pre-analytical errors are metabolism or icing for storage and transport, uh, and I'll talk about that later. Inadequate mixing, I'll also talk about that later. Liquid heparin dilution, that's rare because, again, we don't use uh, liquid heparin much anymore at all for, for anticoagulants in, in, a, in a blood collection device. Trapped air is a big concern, particularly with pneumatic tube system transport. 
cause errors initially with PO2, but change in that can also affect the oxyhemoglobin and the oxygen content. And finally, we have at the bottom analytic errors caused by interfering light-absorbing substances. This would most commonly be uh, lipids. If there's a very high lipid content, that would make it tur turbid, can affect light absorbance. But also sulf hemoglobin, hemoglobin variants in cobalamins and other colored compounds can affect, can absorb light and affect the result. Those are less common, or more common, or I'm sorry, less common than lipids. Improper mixing is a concern. First of all, if you let whole blood samples sit, they sediment fairly rapidly. And that's with any sample, any whole blood sample. But this is especially so with inflammatory conditions, because if you think about it, that's the basis of the old sed rate test that's been around for many, many, many years. And inflama inflammatory conditions are very common in the hospital, you know, with uh, any type of chronic infection, sepsis, even during operations. Chronic kidney diseases, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and many others. So inflammation is a very common occurrence. And where that becomes a concern is that uh, it makes sample sediment even faster if you let them sit. So I would say even three or four minutes of sitting can start to cause the cells to, to uh, sediment. So it's important to mix thoroughly in two axes after the draw to dis distribute the heparin and also before the analysis. So proper mixing will reduce the hemoglobin and oxygen content errors and mix immediately after collection prevents coagulation and formation of microclots. Sure. This is a big problem because it can very frequently happen. And the person may not, the collector may not expel the air bubbles appropriately. So trapped air can significantly lower or raise PO2, percent oxyhemoglobin, and oxygen content of blood samples I've mentioned. The variables are the volume of trapped air added. So of course, more air added uh, is a concern. Agitation of the syringe by pneumatic tube transport is a concern. The number and size of air bubbles, so one big air bubble is less, has less of an effect than the numerous small air bubbles because of surface area to volume relationships. The original PO2 of the sample can be, a, be important, as I'll show you in the, next, in the next slide. And the original hemoglobin concentration and oxyhemoglobin levels are also important. So oxygen is buffered by hemoglobin, so we have a high hemoglobin concentration, that's going to show less of an effect on the oxygen parameters than a low hemoglobin. Here's a study we did uh, a few years ago. On the x-axis, we have the original PO2 of the blood sample. So when you were 40 up to over 250 millimeters of mercury, the sample that we looked at. We would then add, we analyzed that sample for, for PO2, we would then add a 20 microliter air bubble and a 40 microliter air bubble to about one ml of that blood and in, in separate syringes. We send it by pneumatic transport on a circuitous route that brought it back to the lab. And we would then measure the PO2, and this shows the changes in PO2 that occur. Most cases, when you have up to a, about a, over 150 millimeters of mercury, it increases the PO2. Just some things to point out, when you have a very low PO2, like 40, 50, 60, the effect is relatively small if you have a small air bubble, 20 microliters. I don't want to encourage that. I'm just saying that we're somewhat fortunate because I think the worst thing would be to call a low PO2 normal. But when you get to the normal PO2 levels, like 90 to 100, that has the greatest effect because the hemoglobin is already almost fully saturated with oxygen. So the excess oxygen from the air bubble goes into the plasma, which is what the, the PO2 electrode detects. Eventually, for very high PO2 samples, like 200 or 250, or certainly higher, that PO2 in the blood is higher than atmospheric PO2, and so it will actually lose oxygen to the, to the air bubble. That could cause a decrease. So whatever, we want to avoid any type of air bubble in a syringe, in a syringe. I do mention again that uh, if we maintain the air bubble as one large bubble, one bubble it has much less of an effect than if you send it, if you jostle it and create a lot of tiny air bubbles, and especially by pneumatic transport. These are the learning objectives of the webinar. Dr. Tofaletti will describe common causes of pre-analytical errors about specimen collection and specimen transport. Also list the common causes of hemolysis and how to report results on hemolyzed specimens.
and he will also uh, present how to implement practices to minimize pre-analytical errors in blood gas analysis. Pre-analytical error, icing during transport. The question comes up a lot, should I use ice or not use ice? Well, ice does inhibit cell metabolism. It does help preserve, can help preserve PO2, pH, PCO2, glucose, lactate, maybe other analytes. However, icing can cause PO2 increases in samples collected in plastic syringes if they are remain in, in ice long enough. So the recommendation, what should you do? I say to do not ice samples if the analysis will occur in less than 30 minutes. If the sample, if the analysis is going to take longer than 30 minutes, will be will not occur until after 30 minutes of sample. I say probably better to ice. You've got opposing effects there. The ice does inhibit metabolism, but what happens when you ice a sample, a whole blood sample? The affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen increases dramatically, and so the the hemoglobin can actually pull in to cause a slow diffusion of oxygen through that plastic syringe. If you think about it. Our PO2 electrodes use polypropylene as the membrane. That's very thin, much thinner than a syringe type. And also, when Leland Clark developed the first PO2 electrodes back many years ago, uh, he used polyethylene as the membrane. So these plastics are permeable to oxygen. Uh, with a syringe, it's not fast. It does take time. But if you let a sample sit in ice for like 60 minutes or more, you're going to see effects uh, because what happens is it pulls in oxygen slowly, and when you analyze that very cold sample in a blood gas analyzer, it comes back to 37 degrees. And under those conditions, the oxygen is released, and you would get an increased PO2 result. With catheter flush, both arterial and venous catheters must be adequately flushed prior to a sample draw. So an adequate flush volume will allow contents of the flush solution to mix with blood and lower the hemoglobin, the hematocrit, and the oxyhemoglobin. So the recommendation is that the waste draw volume should be at least two times the catheter dead space volume. So if you know that there's like one ml of space, a volume, between where the arterial line or venous line that goes into the patient versus where you collect the blood sample, you should collect twice that as dead space and, 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 uh, and discard it or save it for if you can put it back in. So th that two times recommendation can vary depending on the flesh solution, you know, the concentration, and also the analyte tested. But in general, two times should be adequate. Capillary samples are uh, prone to preanalytical errors, particularly with coximetry, but other tests as well. Capillary samples show more variability than arterial or venous samples. And why is that? Well, it just makes physiologic sense because you're going from arterial concentrations to venous concentrations in a fairly small uh, length of time, very small. And so there are clearly changes that are occurring in those capillaries. And so depending on where you make the slit, hopefully we get kind of a, a mixture of that so it's a more consistent result for the analytes. But there are changes that are occurring as that blood goes through the capillaries. That's just part of physiology. Real variability is most often associated with squeezing the puncture site before or after the puncture. That can cause contamination with interstitial fluids, and any time anytime there's poor peripheral circulation and also edema, that can contribute to the variability. The proper collection of capillary samples is important, so I've mentioned that. So you should arterialize, so-called arterialize the sample. That can yield pH and PCO2 results that are very close to arterial and PO2 results that are somewhat lower than arterial. It's always going to be lower than arterial, but that can be very helpful to uh, physicians. If the uh, PO2 is, is certainly normal, that means you're doing, the patient is not hypoxemic, and a, with a, if a capillary PO2 is normal, that certainly means the arterial PO2 is going to be normal. And even if it's a little bit low, that is a good indication that the arterial is probably okay, with much less trauma than going to an arterial stick. Important is to pre-warm the puncture site the general recommendation is to up to 42 degrees, and that will increase blood flow several fold. I've seen estimates of anywhere from two or three fold increase up to seven fold increase. It's important to let the blood flow freely. Anytime you milk the, the, the skin or the area where you're collecting the sample, that can introduce venous blood and also interstitial fluid and cause greater variability. You should fill the capillary tube completely, 
No air bubbles, sealed ends, which usually means they hold it with a gloved hand and carry it to the lab, I hope, or get, get the analysis done. And of course, very important to analyze within 15 minutes, as soon as possible. But uh, capillary samples can have a very a, a definite changes if you're if you're careless with how you uh, how you transport them. So, just for proper spec proper specimen handling, or you should mix prior to analysis. You should remove air bubbles, mix immediately. No air bubbles makes mixing less efficient, so you have to be so you have to be very careful how you mix the sample. So immediately after collection, mix by inverting the syringe five times. This is a recommendation that I've seen for in print. Roll it between the palms for five to 10 seconds, and that helps disperse the anticoagulant. If analysis is delayed, important to mix in two axes. So storage syringe specimens should be mixed by gently inverting the syringe 10 times, and then rolling it horizontally between the palms for 20 to 60 seconds. And there may be variations on that, but generally you have to just make sure that it's mixed properly if there's any kind of set sitting delay in analysis. I want to close here with four cases. I say the first two are fairly easy. Last two may be a bit more challenging. So case number one, and these illustrate some of the points that I've mentioned in this talk. So during a very difficult and hectic surgical case, some erratic hemoglobin results are noted from a blood gas analyzer located in the operating room. The hemoglobin results on successive samples were 12.2, 6.8, 9.8, 11.2, 8.3. .8, so it's fairly unlikely that those are actual results in, in the patient. Those, those are just too much variability. So when the lab investigated these results, the anesthesia tech said they sometimes had to leave a specimen on the table before the analysis because of a you know, hectic case. They, they then inverted the same fringe a few times before analyzing it. So can you explain these variable hemoglobin results? I'll let you think about that for just a few seconds and explain it. Well, this case illustrates the point I just made just a, just a minute ago, where if a sample sits, and this can occur, like I said, in, uh, in critical care situations, particularly operating rooms, they collect a sample, what they think is maybe only a minute can easily become four or five minutes or longer. So it looked like they were letting the sample sit a lot of like I said, they're distracted by the patient, as they should be, and so the sample sits and it can sediment fairly rapidly. They're probably not mixing it well enough by simply inverting it a few times before analyzing it. So that causes some highly variable hemoglobin results. Okay, next, case two. Samples from an OR analyzed at point of care by a blood gas analyzer had PO2 results consistently in the 75 to 90 millimeter mercury range. So those are a little bit low and normal in that kind of range there. So to check these results, they did send two specimens by pneumatic tube to the laboratory. These PO2 results were 105 and 112 millimeters of mercury. And also the medical technologist noted that there was some bloody foam in the syringes before they analyzed them. So what do you think this is? You know, you might think, well, the lab values must be correct. They've got the more accurate analyzers. But there are also some important clues here, uh, notably that they sent it by pneumatic tube, and when the metal technologists looked at the sample, they have some bloody foam in the syringes before, before analyzing them. So can you explain these differences in PO2 results? Well, when you send a sample with pneumatic tube, you leave an air bubble in it, the pneumatic tube is going to act like a, uh, uh, it's going to thoroughly mix those air bubbles. Uh, if you remember some of the, if we're a little bit older, we might remember what's called a tonometer. That would equilibrate blood with, uh, with, with air, with various con concentrations of oxygen in the air. Well, the pneumatic tube acts like a, a tonometer in a way. It will equilibrate that blood with whatever air is put in that syringe so it, it comes back as a froth or a, you know, a foam almost. So I think that's what was happening. So the more accurate results were probably at the point of care, almost certainly at the point of care, and pneumatic tube uh, sending these would cause an increase. Case number three. This is a little bit more difficult. Blood collect, blood, the, blood, uh, the blood was collected in the gel separator tube, and it gave a potassium of 9.8 millimoles per liter when run as plasma on the main chemistry analyzers. Repeating the uh, test on that and on a different analyzer of the same type confirmed this result. So they both gave you know very high potassiums. The caregivers called because the potassium done on a blood gas analyzer earlier was only 4.8 millimoles per liter. 
So we looked at the sample. This is an actual case I will always remember. Visual inspection of that sample revealed the specimen was quite cloudy. It wasn't lipemic. You know, cholesterol, triglycerides were quite normal. So can you explain the very different potassium results? Give you just a little bit of time to think about that. And what happened here was that when we looked at some of the other results, and the clue was that there was a cloud, the specimen was cloudy even after centrifugation. What happened was that this person had on, the, on their cell count had a very high white cell count, about 100,000 per microliter. And so what was happening was all the white cells were not being centrifuged through the gel and down into the layer below the gel. So they were remaining in the plasma phase. What happens then when you analyze these on a regular chemistry analyzer, they're, of course, they're, they're diluted, the samples are diluted, and the diluents contain a detergent. And so our theory is that these were being lysed and, uh, and, and before they're being analyzed when the potassium was being released, and that was causing the very large interference. So in this case, the blood gas analyzer gave the correct result. And finally, case number four. Two pediatric microtainer specimens were collected by a nurse. At about 2 o'clock in the morning, they arrived in the lab at that time. One was a lavender top for hematology, you know, the blood count. And the other was a green top tube for chemistry, a basic metabolic panel was done. The potassium, when you did the, bone, the BNP, was 10 millimoles per liter, and the calcium, total calcium was 2.3 milligram per deciliter. That's very low. So can you explain these possible errant results? This is a bit more difficult because you might have to think about both the time of day and uh, how the blood might be collected with microtainers. What we almost surely happened in this case was that the sample, the, the, the tube caps were mixed up. So the blood that was collected in the, uh, in the uh, hematology sample with potassium EDTA had the green top put back on it and just vice versa. So the one that was heparin for BNP testing had the lavender top. And so the having potassium EDTA in there would cause, of course, a dramatic increase in the potassium. And if you remember, the EDTA, a very tight binder of calcium, would cause the calcium to go down. That's certainly true for ionized calcium. EDTA is so tight that it actually affects the total calcium as well. So I believe that's what the case. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That concludes my... Okay. Thank you, Dr. Toffoletti, for that informative presentation. Uh, we're going to have a time for a few questions here, uh, and if anyone else has a question in the meantime, feel free to put that into the chat or the, the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. So I'll go ahead and, and read the first question for you. Um, so what is the most common source of error in blood gas specimen collection? Well, uh, just right on first hearing that, I would say that uh, it would be it'd be air bubbles in the sample. Um, as I think about it, uh, it would also might depend on whether it's collected at the point of care or, or, or sent to the lab, maybe by a pneumatic tube or possibly even be, being carried. Uh, if it's collected at the point of care, probably air bubbles don't make that much difference because there's no pneumatic transport there and there's probably very little agitation of the sample. So, But, but in, in the lab, um, if it's set to the lab, there's a, I would say the air bubbles would be a common problem causing the changes in PO2 and also probably clots. I do, do get a, some, some complaints about clotting, which it could occur from a, a variety of sources, be either possibly washing out the heparin in, a, in the uh, syringe when it's collected, before the blood is collected, uh, maybe washing out with the IV fluid perhaps, or they're not mixing the sample properly. And once uh, clotting starts, heparin does not, just cannot dissolve a clot. It's just, just useless for that. For point of care, uh, probably not mixing uh, properly if, it, if it's allowed to sit down, sit around a while. And I would say that's especially true in the operating room or any place where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of chaos perhaps or a lot of other uh, involvement with the patient. And so they forget uh, that they, they collect the sample, let it sit for a while. And it's very easy to, to let one minute go by or think it's only one minute, and in fact, it's like three or four. So I would say those, those two things, you know, uh, uh, bubbles in the sample, allowing the sample to get clots or microclots, and then, uh, and then settling of the sample. Okay, very good. Um, another question. In the presentation, you mentioned icing was not necessary anymore. Why is that? 
Well, I, would, I didn't say it was not necessary anymore. It's a matter of uh, the effects that icing has on increasing the PO2 in plastic syringes and also increasing the potassium, which will increase leakage of potassium out of cells versus the effects of metabolism. The metabolism at room temperature is going to be worse, but then and so icing will salt will improve that, but icing causes problems, as I said, with the PO2 and the potassium. So it's a matter of balance. You know, how long do you want it to, to wait? Uh, I would say somewhere in the 15 to 30 minute range, we we say if it's going to be less than 30 minutes, do not ice. If it's going to be longer than 30 minutes, do put the sample on ice because you want to minimize the metabolic effects. And of the two, I think that after 30 minutes, you uh, the, the metabolic effects would be worse than the uh, increase in PO2 from uh, from permeability of the uh, the syringes. So no, I didn't say don't ever use ice. The other thing is you can never use ice on, on, on a pneumatic tube, so uh, that's another reason. So we generally don't use ice. Okay. Um, so another one, you, uh, you mentioned extracellular fluid contamination affecting capillary samples, and you also mentioned intracellular. Can you please explain or provide examples? Well, I don't know if I can provide examples, but that would be with, with squeezing of the uh, of the tissue at the puncture site. Uh, usually it's not a problem with venipunctures or if the arterial or venous line is already in place, that's usually not a problem there. That would really be a problem with capillary samples. And uh, you, you, as, as you squeeze, you, uh, you, have the, uh, you have the greater possibility of introducing inter the interstitial fluids and, the, uh, and possibly intracellular fluids if you really do a really squeeze hard. I'd say mostly interstitial fluids more than intercellular fluids. hope that answered the question, and I was a little bit puzzled by exactly what was meant by that, but uh, maybe I hope that did a good job there. So uh, someone asked, are there different reference ranges for central venous versus venous samples, especially for glucose? Well, we don't provide those, but I can just tell you that central venous, if you think about it, that is all the venous blood being mixed back together. So that represents the entire body metabolism. And for certain measurements, so for like, like oxygen consumption and oxygen delivery, you really need that measurement. Well, if you just do a venipuncture like at the, usually at the antecubital vein in the arm, that represents metabolism that has occurred in the, uh, I guess, in the hand and part of the arm. So it's more localized. Generally, there's not a huge difference with, with many of the analytes. Oxygen, maybe. Glucose, a little bit, maybe. I'd say not, not, not to a great extent. But, you know, we're so used to getting our reference values and our usual clinical values from, uh, from venipunctures in the, in the common places like the arm that that's what we use. So you certainly don't need central venous uh, collections for most analytes, but I would say for PO2 and uh, possibly pH and PCO2 that that's, is more more useful. Uh, would you recommend chloride measurement on a blood gas analyzer? Hmm. I guess it never hurts if it's there. Uh, you know, I hear that many analyzers have a chloride electrodes on them now. So it, you know, it, it chloride can be useful with differentiating some types of acid-base disorders. So it's it's always a good thing to have. I don't know if that would consider it essential, but it's a, it's a good thing to have. Okay. And uh, how long can a gel SST tube be open before testing ionized calcium? Well, as I said there, the fact that you've even used a uh, SST, a SST or serum, the clotting process itself causes changes in the uh, pH, I presume the pH in the ionized calcium. I would almost consider that a, a bigger problem. Um, now go, go over that again. Do they ask how, how long can it be opened? Uh, how long can the tube be open for testing? Okay, open. Um, we say, uh, I would say if it's just briefly open, not much of an issue, of course, has to be opened anyway. I would say somewhere uh, in, and maybe within, within, you know, within five minutes. You don't want it to stay open very long. So, uh, do you know how creatinine results will be affected in milking uh, in capillary collections? Do they increase or decrease? <laughs> I should know that. Creatinine is one of my favorite analytes. Uh, okay. I, I would guess that it's lower in interstitial fluids, but I, you know, I don't know that. That's that's a you know difficult question, but certainly an interesting one. Uh, 
the best thing is not to milk the sample anyway. You know, you, as I said before, arterialize it, make sure there's good blood flow in the capillaries, do a puncture, let it flow freely. That, that's the best answer to that, and so you're not getting the effects of, uh, of interstitial fluids, you know. And creatinine, I'll be fairly certain, changes very, very little as you go from arterial to venous. So if you get really good blood sampled, it should, be, it should not be much of an effect. A specific one here of uh, the ionized calcium table that you presented. Uh, do you right. know what the, the, what the temperature of the samples was in that? Well, that would be at room temperature. Okay. All right. And then someone asked, does a high PO2 in blood move out of plastic syringe, resulting in loss of PO2? I would say, you know, that's, <laughs> I, can't, I have to say I've never studied that. But if you go back to what the mechanism for why it causes an effect anyway, uh, if it's in glass syringes, there's, there's really, the, 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 you know, as the hemoglobin affinity increases, it can pick up oxygen, but it can only happen oxygen in that blood sample. It cannot pull it in from the outside. So what apparently happens is the theory, and seemed like a good mechanism, is that as the hemoglobin gets colder, it dramatically increases its, its affinity for oxygen. And so it binds the oxygen. That can create a diffusion of oxygen from the outside into the, into the blood itself. And if you think about it, you may say, oh, that's hard to believe. Well, just remember that polypropylene is the membrane used in PO2 electrodes today. And back when Leland Clark developed these initially, it was polyethylene, which is what is used for plastic syringes today. Now, of course, plastic syringes are much thicker than a membrane on these analyzers. The problem comes about as you, uh, as you gain this oxygen at cold temperatures, what temperature is the sample analyzed at? Well, that's back at 37 degrees. And so then the oxygen comes off of the hemoglobin into the aqueous phase. And that is what an oxygen sensor of PO2 measures, is the oxygen pressure or tension in the aqueous phase. So that, that's the cause of the error. As far as going back out of the syringe, I bet that would be very, very slow as far as how fast it would go back into the atmosphere. And uh, it would have to be greater than about 150 millimeters of mercury to even cause a gradient. So uh, I think that would be very, very, very little. More, more a bigger concern is when you actually open the syringe. It, the one thing I can say about a blood sample with a high PO2 is that oxygen in the aqueous phase is very unstable. So it doesn't take long to, uh, to lose that oxygen out of the blood. And if you notice on that chart I showed, that plot of uh, pneumatic tube transport, as you get, if you have a sample with a high PO2 in an air bubble, you're going to lower your, your PO2. Okay. hope that answered it. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so for, for newborns, what analytes do you recommend drawing capillary in which by vena puncture? Well, uh, you know, with newborns, it's almost all done by heel sticks. Uh, I wish I had our pediatric collections here to answer that. But I know, you know they're mostly done by, by heel sticks, just somewhat less painful, uh, but certainly still painful. So I, I guess that's the answer I would give. Uh, uh, as they get older, then things like microtainers are possible. and. Uh, and uh, you know, for, for blood gases, you want to try and minimize exposure to air. But sometimes that's what you you're, the, the, that's what you're left with for, for very small neonates. Okay, very good. Well, I uh, have a lot of questions here still, but uh, we're limited in time, so we'll uh, we'll close it out. But uh, again, we appreciate your time, Dr. Tafaletti, and uh, for all the uh, listeners, we'll be sending out a. a uh, follow-up email with uh, a survey to get your uh, continuing education credit. You need to fill out that survey. Yeah. And also... Rick, I would say that, Rick, I would say that if anybody has a burning question, they can certainly email me, and I'll try to answer it best I can. Okay, great. And your email address? Well, that's my name. It's john.toffoletti at duke.edu. Okay. Great. Okay, thanks for your time, and... Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, great.